Hi, and welcome to the Fair Perspectives podcast, the official podcast of the pro-human movement brought to you by the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. I'm your host, Melissa Chen, and my co-host, who you will hear from shortly, is Angel Eduardo. Today, we speak with Dr. Eric Smith. Eric is an associate professor of rhetoric at York College of Pennsylvania, who is interested in the rhetorics of anti-racist activism, theory, and pedagogy. He is also the co-founder of Free Black Thought, a website dedicated to highlighting viewpoint diversity within the Black intelligentsia. In this episode, we discussed his field of rhetoric, what led him to it, African-American vernacular English versus standard English, the implications of Black linguistic justice, what it's like teaching rhetoric in our climate today, the utility of ridicule, his critique of anti-racism, interacting with Nicole Hannah-Jones, and the relative merits of free Black thought in Candace Owens's Blexit. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Professor Eric Smith. Professor Eric Smith, welcome to the Fair Perspectives podcast. Hi, nice to be had. I wanted to dive straight into what you do because I think it's really it's really interesting. Um, when I when I met you, I think for the first time last year, uh, you mentioned to me you were a professor of rhetoric, and you know it's just not a thing that most people are very aware of. Um, can you kind of run us through what exactly is rhetoric and how it differs from like other similar concepts like dialectics or debate and things like that? Um, well, I think all those things are subcategories of uh, rhetoric, uh, dialectic, and debate. But the general, perhaps the most common definition of rhetoric comes from Aristotle. And he said that rhetoric is uh, the ability in any given situation to discern the available means of persuasion. So what does that mean? Any given situation. So, you know, uh, you can find yourself in a context where certain metaphors or references um, it will be more effective, more persuasive than they would be in another context. The ability to discern that and then speak or write accordingly um, is rhetoric. That's the general idea of it. So it's basically um, audience consideration and considering the uh, values, attitudes, and beliefs of an audience um, before speaking, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's the uh, general um, idea of rhetoric. So within that, you, you have, you know, debate as well. You're considering not just the topic, um, but your opponent, and you are considering the audience. So that's an even more dynamic, um, you know, discerning of available means of persuasion. And I mean, it's, there are a lot of uh, different definitions of rhetoric, but they are all considered, for the most part, footnotes to Aristotle's, right? So, uh, so, so uh, that's the simple answer. And I think this is great, actually, because I can, I, I'm, as you're giving the definition, I can see how someone like you ended up doing something like this. Um, but for for those of for those of us who don't know you as well, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about what drew you to that and how you ended up being a professor of rhetoric? Well, that is a very long story. I'm going to have to curate some <laughs> yeah. memories and things like that to uh, make it as concise as possible. Um, but um, I I grew up uh, kind of in two worlds, I guess uh, you can say. Uh, you know, I, I think it's the same world, really. But um, you know, um, most people would look from the outside, looking in, uh, see two different worlds. I uh, grew up in a predominantly uh, white neighborhood um, and dealt with that. And then uh, upon going to high school, which was a regional high school, I was um, Finally, among uh, other black students who, um, you know, didn't think I was black enough because I was socially constructed in a in a white space. So there you have two different contexts, um, which uh, command two different uh, dialects, uh, two different um, uh, sets of rhetorical considerations, right? And uh, two different discourses. And when I say discourse, I'm I'm, I'm using the social linguist uh, James G's definition of discourse, which, which is um, not just social identity, not just words, uh, language, uh, but the values, attitudes, and beliefs 
that are preferred in the given uh, community, right? I noticed that the values, attitudes, and beliefs didn't transfer um, as smoothly as I thought they would, right? Um, and I, I, I tell people this all the time, like uh, when, when in the um, predominantly white environment, you know, I thought I was Fred Hampton. I thought I was the blackest dude, you know, in the world, <laughs> right? You know, I didn't think there would be a problem, you know, right. uh, you know, transitioning. And then I, I realized, oh, I, um, I do not have, I'm not looking through, at the world through the same lens mm -hmm. at all. Uh, I, I am seeing things that they don't. They're seeing things that I don't. They're valuing things that I don't and vice versa. Right. Mm -hmm. and, um, so, I mean, I didn't have the term rhetoric at my disposal at the time. Um, and I didn't discover this as a field until graduate school. I was getting uh, an MA in American literature mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and American philosophy. And I, and I got that MA. You know, I, I do teach uh, a, a course on American philosophy. Um, a you know lower income course. As I do, it's just a master's, right? Um, but I found um, rhetoric in graduate school and decided to get my PhD in it, um, motivated strongly by the story I just told you, you know, and and um, what it takes to be uh, persuasive in various different situations, mm -hmm. right? And and um, in doing that, I ultimately and many a rhetorician does. I, I, I embrace this concept called Kairos. And Kairos, as concisely as I can put it, is the confluence of time, place, audience, subject matter. All these things come together to dictate what you not only should say, but what you can say, right? And how you can say it. Um, so, I mean, you can have the same audience, same subject matter, right? Uh, same place, but you may have different things at your disposal in the afternoon than you did in the morning based mm -hmm. on happenings going on between the morning and the afternoon. So it's that, it's that concise, right? Yeah. Uh, it's that ridiculous of a consideration that that's uh, Kairos or what I call a chirotic disposition. So uh, that's a long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> well, actually, I, I would love to I would love to dig into that a little bit. So, you know, you didn't have the word rhetoric at your disposal, but you were recognizing something, right? There was, there was something going on in your ability or inability to communicate based on certain environments that you were in. What were, what were those environments like? What was different and what was different about you that made you notice that? Um, and you're talking about uh, my younger years, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. What was different about me? Well, um, like I said earlier, um, I think I value different things, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, and, and for example, right. Um, when I would tell a joke or something like that, and somebody would praise me for that joke, I would say, hey, well, I, it's not my joke. I got it from this comedian, right. Just to be fair. So I was, uh, I, I had a firm appreciation for citation even then. <laughs> Although I didn't even realize it. Um, but uh, when I would do that, you know, um, amongst my new African-American friends, uh, you know, uh, they would look at me like I was crazy. Like, well, you don't need to do that. Just just take a, take credit for the joke, you know. Um, and that's a small and, uh, you know, maybe simple example of what I'm talking about with the differences in values. Um you know, uh, my aspirations uh, were different, right? My, um, the value I put on having a particular reputation were, was different. Um, I didn't, I didn't uh, have those values in common with them. So, so mm -hmm. that's, that really stuck out to me. And again, I didn't have the language for any of this, right? right. Um, but yeah. Um, Eric, I, I wanted to ask you, um, cause it seems like the goal of rhetoric is, is to reach some sort of understanding. Like the goal is actually to be understood by whoever it is that you are speaking to. Correct. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, you, you wrote a piece that's, that's coming out for the fair Substack, or is already out, um, by the time people see this mm -hmm. about, um, this, uh, use of African-American vernacular. Yeah. And how um, 
and how your field, people who are teaching rhetoric and communications today, um, now seem to not value code switching um, and in fact see the need for students to learn standard English as uh, some sort of racism or as Angel once called it, linguistic imperialism. <laughs> um, and so therefore, there's a lot of, um, th there seems to be a lot of activism going on in your field that you disagree with. Um, could you kind of sum up for people watching this, what that disagreement is and what's going on in rhetoric? Um, well, the disagreement is over this concept of what's called black linguistic justice. And what that is, is, um, you know, uh, fighting for the right of African-American students to use African-American vernacular in their writing, right? Uh, and, you know, it's really about self-expression, right? And, 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 and dignity and, you know, writing the wrongs of history and things like that. What it's not about is pragmatism and rhetoric, right? Um, the dialect you should use, especially when it comes to writing, should depend on the context and the uh, the, um, the 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 purpose of the writing, right? And uh, if you do have an audience that you think would be confused um, by a non-standard dialect, right? Then you can use the standard dialect in that situation. If you have an audience that would uh, find more ethos in a non-standard dialect, perhaps you can use that in that situation. Again, kairos, right? Uh, things need to be considered chirotically. And that's not going on here. Context is very important to the concept of rhetoric and context is being thrown out the window right mm -hmm. now, right? Uh, in fact, um, what's being embraced is historical context. And when people use that in my field, in my conversations anyway, uh, what they mean is that the history of the United States is one of uh, oppression of minorities and things like that. That's the context, right? So within that large context, uh, they're making their decisions. Um, there comes a point where historical context is no context at all, really, because you're not looking at the present situation and the exigencies of that situation and acting accordingly. You're not doing that. You're ignoring it. You're, you're projecting things onto that situation that may not be accurate. Um, all these things are problems I see uh, with what's going on in the field. And um, as I talk about in that article, the idea of Black students not embracing this opportunity to use African-American English is uh, considered a vice uh, among them, right? It's mm -hmm. considered, as one uh, leader in the field says, selfish and immature to want to learn uh, standardized English because you're perpetuating the status quo, right? Right. Uh, so that those are the issues I have. So it's more than just, yes, yeah, so I, th I think you clarified well, because I think it's not that context goes out the window. It's that they're, they're prioritizing one context and imposing it on every other context. Right. Right. To, to, yeah. to the detriment of any other possible context. Right. Um, and so the way this plays out, you know, to get more concrete is we have a student who is attending a first year writing course. And then, you know, this, this student is racialized as black. And basically the idea is we should be encouraging them to use uh, what's called their home dialect or their code meshed dialect rather right. than standard English. Right. And any pushback the student gives because, well, you, you tell us, why would the student give pushback to that? The student will give pushback because the student has an appreciation for practic practicality, maybe. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, the student wants to uh, acquire the skill that might come in handy, you know, in civic and professional context, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that student does not necessarily look down on African uh, American vernacular English, um, but that student wants to add to his or her repertoire, right? It's not a replacement. It's being it's being talked about as if the students have to replace something, right? No, the student is adding uh, to um, an already rich uh, mode of communication, 
right? Mm. That's the idea. What's more, um, people in my field are assuming that Black students, uh, you know, identify with African-American vernacular English on an almost ontological level. That's not necessarily true. Um, not all Black students even use African-American vernacular English. Uh, they may have been raised in a uh, context or a community where that wasn't the norm, right? So these considerations aren't being taken. So those students, when they refuse to write in African-American vernacular English because they came to this class to learn something and not to do what they already know, right? Uh, when they do that, they are considered immature and selfish. Uh, they're considered people who have colonized minds, right? Their minds have been colonized. Uh, they, they're suffering from some kind of uh, linguistic Stockholm syndrome, right? That that's, <laughs> that's how they're looked at. Right. And, and I, I think that's, it's, 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 it's absurd, you know, uh, for sure, but it's also quite depressing and antithetical to rhetoric, right? Which is what we're supposed to be doing. But much of this logic to me seems to be, um, as you mentioned, the reason why the emphasis is on speaking, say, your home dialect, is is really kind of uh, elevating this idea of self-expression, right, and your right. own identity. And and it seems to me that in this kind of weird mode of thinking, there is this idea that objectivity or or, or working towards some sort of standard is um, considered white supremacy culture or something mm-hmm. of the sort, and so you know changing yourself, your original self to kind of meet that standard is therefore seen as oppressive. And what's interesting is you do also see this in, you know, say the, the fat studies movement, any sort of, um, uh, you know, like it, it, it is your self-expression. And so any idea to define what is a healthy weight, for example, is, is oppressive in nature. And so it, um, there is, there is some sort of like imputed it's not value neutral anymore. Like, because you have to work towards a standard in society. I think this is where Mm -hmm. that argument is coming from, right? If, if, if if I'm trying, because I'm trying to understand. Right. Um, And is that what, is that what's going on here? Um, Well, yes. I mean, it's, people see it as being compelled to adopt uh, the language of the oppressor, right? Okay. Um, That's, that's how it's seen. So if you're looking at this through the narrative, uh, the typical third wave anti-racist narrative, uh, then it's not a practical acquisition of a skill that might come in handy. It's moral pressure, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's what it is, uh, first and foremost. And they see that to the neglect of uh, practicality and rhetorical savvy, uh, which is a mistake. Uh, and it's also why I think that, how should I say this? Um, I'll say it this way. It is possible to be a scholar and an activist, right? To mm-hmm. some degree. And there comes a point where scholarship and activism can bump heads because activism has a particular goal and mm-hmm. one's research and scholarship and the stats, uh, the empirical evidence and things like that may um, show that that goal is either detrimental or unnecessary. And that activist will ignore that information, mm-hmm. right, and 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 uh, focus on the goal at hand. And I think a lot of that's happening here. We're we're ignoring practicality and and uh, pragmatic use of language uh, to uh, achieve this goal of uh, dignity, right? Uh, and and we can get dignity in other places. You know, just thinking about this, I'm trying to go backwards, and I'm tr- I'm thinking like. So F- James Baldwin and Frederick Douglass were using the language of the oppressor? Yes. And then, well, okay, fine. But then so were, so were George Washington and John Adams because the language, the language is English. So it's from mm-hmm. the people who were ruling over them, right? So right. It, it just keeps, if you keep going back, it just, it doesn't make sense where, where one decides to plant the flag and say, these are the people who are to blame. You know? right. This is yes. This is all about you know. Uh, these are all consequences of the politics of resentment uh, mm. to a large degree, right? And it 
also neglects the fact that whatever standard we choose is going to be a standard and therefore right. <laughs> oppressive to somebody, right? right? I mean, let's let's say tomorrow African-American vernacular English is the standard, right? So now we're, you know, uh, we're pushing other dialects aside. And mm-hmm. now they have a beat. I mean, it doesn't, the, the point is effective and clear communication, being understood, right? And being able to identify with your audience enough to persuade them. That's it, mm-hmm. right? right? So everything else is a subcategory or a sub consideration of that. I feel like there's an analogy here to the Tower of Babel, you know, that biblical story, because mm-hmm. I'm trying to understand, like, if, if, we take this to the logical conclusion. Let's say everybody is just allowed to write in their, you know, their own vernacular, their own um, dialect or patois. Mm -hmm. Then like, like I I grew up in Singapore. Our patois is called Singlish. It's literally Singaporean English and it makes no sense to the average person, American who tries to go there. But, but we, we write and we're educated in standard, Queen's English, British English, British spelling, which is why I get caught up on Twitter sometimes with my spelling. Still. <laughs> but but the but what's spoken is a, a weird syncretic blend of Malay, Chinese, and all this stuff, and it's mm. it grammatically doesn't make sense. Um, but so imagine if everyone's kind of speaking their own, you know, dialect like that, then what you have is a Tower of Babel situation where no one's understanding each other, right? And, mm-hmm. and yeah, sure, we're wearing the flag of our identity because I think why people fight so hard to have this. I mean, at least that was the case in, in Singapore um, that, um, the, the, you know, the first prime minister said that Singlish was a handicap to the nation. It holds us back. So get rid of it. There was a speak good English campaign, right? Which today would be considered some sort of, as you say, angel, linguistic imperialism and racism. But, um, but there, there was a, that campaign to kind of rid the nation of Singlish. It was seen as it was holding the nation back. And, it, you know, in part, like, I, I think today people kind of embrace that a little bit more because it's what makes the country unique. It's, it's different than, yeah. than, than anything else. And, and so, but the, the order of the day there is to code switch. So when we're working, you know, when we're writing documents and working with foreign companies and multinational corporations, We'll speak Queen's English, write in Queen's English, and then switch over when, when you're conversing to your family. So it seems people there seem to slide in and out of this very easily. Yeah. But it seems like here the, there is this push. There is this push to just, all right, we're just going to write, you know, in, in our own vernacular. If you don't do that, you know, you're denying your own self-expression. Right. But the end of the, the the line there to me is is the what happens at the end of the Tower of Babel, that, you know, allegory about, about what happens when everyone's speaking their own language and there's no more understanding between each other. Uh, yeah, I think that's a, a, a decent analogy. Uh, and I mean, I, I um, assign, and I'm going to do this uh, next week, as a matter of fact, I assign an essay that's written in um, code meshed English, African-American vernacular and uh, standard English. Uh, and the argument is a scholarly essay. And the argument is that you can use African American dialect and still, you know, do scholarly work, which is fine, and and that's great. You know, so the point is not, you know, uh, effective communication. The point is not addressing your audience um, with the dialect that you know they are most familiar with. Mm-hmm. It's not about that. It's just it's just proving that you know uh, you you should respect us. You should respect uh, the dialect, right? That, that's the point. Again, it's, it's about dignity. I call it dignity grab, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, that's what it's about. And yes, okay, fine. We know that you can be intelligent and while using African-American vernacular English, that's only part of the point, right? Uh, the other part of the point, a substantial part of the point is effective communication period. Mm -hmm. And people think that code switching is admitting, all right, uh, your dialect's better, right? So I'm going to switch to that one and then switch to mine in a more, uh, when I'm in a more inferior context. It's not, right, it's it's not your dialect is better. It's your dialect may be more appropriate for this situation, right? 
And there, are, there will be times when AABE, African-American Vernacular English, will be more appropriate for a particular situation, right? So mm -hmm. it's about context, you know, and it's, yeah. it's about adaptability, right? Rhetorical adaptability. Moving from one situation to another and having the means to uh, speak persuasively and have people understand you to the best of your ability. Hmm. This allows us actually to close a loop that uh, I, I know you didn't mean, but as as you were uh, as you were giving like your background, you you made the distinction between growing up in a predominantly white space and then mm -hmm. moving into a predominantly black space, and how the difference there, like you were acculturated in one way, and then it didn't quite graft itself as easily into the, the, the other context, right? right? But so much of the problem that we're talking about here, I think, is rooted in essentialism. It's this idea that, oh, you look like this, therefore this is your dialect. And if you don't use it, if you reject it, you are denying yourself. You are denying who you are because this must be grafted onto you. So I, I would love if you could clarify those, those ideas there. Um, yeah, so there's this idea that because I'm black, my natural dialect is African American vernacular English, which isn't uh, necessarily true. I um, am quite comfortable with um, AABE and standard English, right? Um, in fact, uh, mm -hmm. for my my life, uh, you know, I've gone back and forth. But I mostly use standard English. Uh, okay, if, but if what happens will, when you're drunk, though? Which which one comes out? Yeah, I, I was just That's about all. to say. I was just about to say. If you wake me up from a cold sleep, I sound like this, right? Oh when, yeah. When okay. I'm when I when I'm hammered, I sound like this. I sound <laughs> the way I'm talking right now. Maybe I'm slurring. Maybe I'm slurring, but it's, it's slurring in standard English, right? And that's just. That's just how I do it. And there's this okay. assumption that I'm mimicking white people when I speak like this. No, yeah. I'm just speaking like this. So that assumption is systemic in my field right now. Yeah. And if you say something else, then you're just, you're just duped. You know, uh, your mind is colonized. You're, you're a victim of, uh, um, you know, white supremacist uh, ideologies and you need help. <laughs> okay, but but just to push back a little, um, I I do remember a time when I believe it was uh, President Biden was taken a task uh, by Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton because he uh, said he was quoted in a newspaper uh, saying that Obama was like the first mainstream African American who is articulate. He used the word articulate, right? And he was obviously alluding to Obama's amazing rhetorical skills. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when, when we all heard that, I think inherently there's just something like, oh, that doesn't sound, you know, there, there's something about it that sounds a little condescending, right. um, if not racist on, on Biden's part saying this, right? And, and I mean, how do you kind of uh, unpack that? Well, again, uh, the idea that African American vernacular English is a legitimate dialect with its own grammar, right? Um, uh, it, its own uh, spelling and things like that. There is a way to do African American vernacular English incorrectly. You know, you, right. you can use you can use incorrect grammar when speaking Black English. You know, right. because there are actual rules. But but the implication was that if he wasn't speaking you know, standard English and wasn't instead speaking African-American vernacular English, that he would therefore not be considered articulate, right? I think right. that that's kind of the implication there. Right, right. And, and, and what I was about to say is that a lot of people, you know, they, they don't realize that they're all dialects. One's just standard, right? One is uh, the dialect of the English who, you know, okay, let's call it what it is, they colonized. Uh, you know, this this space, this area. And now that is the uh, standard dialect. The idea mm. from people who are pushing Black linguistic justice, part of their idea anyway, is basically saying that this dialect is as good, right, as standard English. And my point is, that's fine. I agree. It is as good. But if we're teaching our students to be as persuasive as possible and um you know uh, as uh 
rhetorically savvy as possible, we should give them, you know, the dialect that's probably going to be most common in civic and professional cultures they will find themselves in. Um, if not now, then definitely in the future, right? Mm. That that's my point. So yes, I mm. agree with them about the legitimacy of A A B E, but that's not really the point. Again, it's a dignity grab. Mm. Yeah, I would love to pivot actually to another piece that you wrote for Discourse Magazine. I read it a little while ago. Um, and it's about ridicule. Yes. And I think the title is Ridicule Ridiculous Ideas, Including Your Own. Yes. Right. And uh, well, just break down what, what argument you were making there and where it came from, because this is super interesting. Uh, well, it, it came from experience, really. Um, and it also came from uh, looking at some tactics of uh, third wave anti-racist in their intolerance of other ideas or other ways of looking at, um, you know, racial justice. And, you know, my thing is that if you can't get through to people or if they won't engage in conversation with you, and it's all about if you don't agree with me, then you're racist. Then, you know, we could walk away, um, which I don't think is, uh, you know, the best idea. But in certain situations, we can ridicule these ridiculous ideas um, for two reasons: um, to show them that you're not, you know, buying, you know, um, their intolerance and, you know, their embrace of this. Uh, illiberal dogma, and probably most importantly, to show people, you know, eavesdropping, you know, uh, the people listening in, uh, that you don't have to take this stuff, mm -hmm. and you can you can leaven the situation with humor, right? And as long as you allow a response, right, then it's uh, I, I think it can be effective. Now, it's not what they do is more like degradation, right? I'm going to ridicule you and not let you talk. I'm going to ridicule you and do my best to silence you and ignore everything you say, right? That, that seems to be uh, what I see anyway, uh, up close and personally, um, especially in my field, ironically, a, a field of rhetoric and composition. Yeah. The, the, yeah, but the the idea is that uh, if you're not allowing the other person to respond to your ridicule, then that's bad. That's that's degradation. Mm -hmm. So and what's more, you have to accept their ridicule of you, you know, and, and as long as you get to respond, that's fine. And I say in the article, I mean, if you want to insult me, go for it. As long as I get to talk, as long as we're having <laughs> a conversation, I don't care. Right. You know, call, call me what you will. Right. You know, let's have this conversation. And uh, that is a um, foreign concept in too many social justice circles. Yeah. So you draw the line between ridicule and degradation, right? And I think it's an important one, but uh, it's an incredibly thin one, I think. Mm. And I'm actually really interested because your, your whole world, your whole enterprise is recognizing the differences in context and the difference the differences in approach based on the context. Once ridicule sets in, I think the context shifts dramatically depending on how you, how you do this ridicule and what exactly the target of your ridicule is, right? So even in your explanation just now, there was a shift between the ridicule of the idea and then the ridicule of the person, right? Like you said, like, you can ridicule me. You yes. didn't say you can ridicule my idea, right? And uh, I think- well yeah. I, I know, you know, you're just speaking kind of off the cuff, but right. I think that indicates to me how closely we tend to see our ideas and our identities, like how, how fused together they are. Yes. Um, perhaps I did misspeak there. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean I, to, I to said, get you. No, 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 it's fine. I mean, right. and, and you, you make a very important point. Um, mm -hmm. I did mean my ideas. You know, okay. um, this is not the, the, the ridiculing is not supposed to be ad hominem. You're ridiculing the ideas. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, you know, the person. Um, and, and, I, and I say this because that idea is being lost even in academia. You can't critique someone's work. If you critique someone's work, you're critiquing them. Right. And therefore you're being violent in some way. 
You know, you're being yeah. a bully if you don't agree with this person. You can't write an article saying, well, I think this person is missing a point here because of X, Y, and Z. You know, um, that's considered an attack. And, and, and it shouldn't be. Um, so I, yeah. I'm glad you made that distinction. And I need to be clear that <laughs> um, I'm talking about ideas and not actual, you know, not right. people. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so you wouldn't respond if somebody... Um, Right. I, I can imagine one of the, the more common um, sort of insults that, or, or attacks that you get is people calling you some sort of race traitor or yes. Uncle Tom, right? And so you're saying that um, that is something that leads to degradation. You're not even going to, there's no point responding to something like that or? Oh, I would respond. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, definitely. I, I, I would respond to that. Um, and I would respond by ridiculing that ridiculous idea, uh, right? That I'm somehow a race traitor. I, I would respond in that sense. I mean, if the context dictates it, if this person is open to having the conversation and, you know, uh, and, and um, you know, uh, hearing me, right? And uh, being open to being convinced that I'm not a race traitor, that's one thing. I don't think I'd use ridicule. But when it seems like that person is, um, you know, embracing this idea that I am uh, inherently flawed because I, I don't know, use standard English or I abide by certain ideologies that they do not. And they're not budging on that. In fact, they don't want me to talk. That's when the, uh, the ridicule has to set in. <laughs> Is ridicule also for, um, because like when you have these conversations, let's say it's on a social media platform like Twitter. Uh-huh. So the conversation isn't just between the two of you. There is right. an entire audience that is watching this exchange take place. Right. And I wonder if sometimes ridicule as a response is even helpful to, you know, the other people watching it um, to, mm. to make a point or to make them see how ridiculous, you know, what just happened was. I, I mean, I, I can kind of, I can kind of see that. I, I think Angel is probably more hesitant to use it than than I am. <laughs> um. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I, I, I think, I think uh, that's the primary reason, in my opinion, uh, to do this to show people that, you know, um, there are people out there who are like, am I missing something? You know, am I maybe, maybe I am wrong. No, you're not wrong. It is a ridiculous idea. <laughs> um, and, and if somebody can point that out right. for you and model the fact that uh, you don't have to take this stuff, right, um, then I think that's very empowering. I think that's needed. Um, I know the idea of ridicule uh, in this situation is controversial. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, uh, but I've come to realize that in certain situations, uh, that's precisely uh, what one should do. Um, it's like, like you said, Melissa, it, it's, it's like an open letter, right? Um, and, and an open letter is to one person, but it's really to a lot of people, right? Um, and social media platforms and things like that, you're not speaking to that other person. In fact, when these kind of conversations do happen, the last person I'm trying to convince is the person I am talking to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it, it already seems like they are not um, willing uh, to have their minds changed at all. So now it is about the other perps, all the people listening in, right? It is about them. Mm-hmm. And now I'm speaking to and for them, or well, to this other person, but for them, right? Right. And and that's that's how I'm conceptualizing this. Again, I know it's not everybody's cup of tea. Yeah, it's not even, I wouldn't say that I'm hesitant to use ridicule. It's more that I'm I'm hyper aware of how thin the line is. And how carefully I have to walk it to ensure that the person recognizes that even if I think what they're saying is completely insane mm-hmm. and I'm going to say so, I'm not saying they're completely insane. Right. right? So, so even, you know, like, uh, I remember going back and forth with a, with a Trump supporter and just saying, you know, at this point, voting for Trump is crazy, right? Like that, that's me, that's me talking about the idea. And then they go, you, but you know, we went back and forth a little bit more. And then he, he called back to that point that I made and said, well, you called me crazy. And I said, no, Mm. I didn't. I said, I think voting for, for Trump is crazy, but you are not crazy. I think you are a human being and you deserve respect. So I made, I made it a very explicit, 
right? But that's yeah. very difficult to do. And it takes time and energy to do that. And Twitter makes it so much harder, right? Uh, just the, yeah. the nature of the platform. So how do you how do you make the distinction clear for yourself? How do you avoid the pratfall and how do you avoid, you know, the miscommunication there? Because the context really does matter. Uh, I make sure as clearly as possible that I am addressing the ideas. I'm talking about the words that just came out of this person's mouth. Mm. And I'm referring to those words, right? Sometimes I'll, you know, and, and this is a, becoming a common practice, fortunately, uh, among people who are serious about clear communication. Um, I will make sure that I understand what this person's talking about. So I'll say, okay, I, I hear you saying this, right? Is, is that correct? Yeah. Right? And if they say yes, then I will say, okay, well, regarding that statement, you know, or something <laughs> comparable, something comparable to regarding that statement. Right. right? Yeah. It doesn't have to be those actual words. Yeah. Um, I, I, but I mean, even even so, as I said earlier, there are people who still think if you're uh, critiquing my ideas and you're attacking me, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are still people like that. And I mean, there's really nothing you can do about it. But at least <laughs> I can maintain my integrity, you know, and say, well, I, I am indeed attacking your ideas. And um, and hopefully the people listening in can see that as well. I'm curious, uh, you know, when you're teaching rhetoric and you're teaching your students, what's it like for that that generation, that cohort? What's it like for you? How how are you receiving what they're experiencing? You know, as you're kind of touching on these topics, you have to touch on these sorts of approaches to communicating. What's going on? Do you think is there is there have you noticed a change, and what is that change looking like? Um, I've had several, uh, you know, white students uh, tell me that I, I there are certain things I just can't say. You know, there's mm -hmm. there's no there's no rhetorically effective way to uh, criticize some of these uh, contemporary anti-racist ideas especially if I am a white male, right? Um, so there's, there's, there's no available means of persuasion there. And I, 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 I find that sad. And I tell them, you know, um, uh, um, there may very well be a way to talk about these things um, if you discern your uh, context and your audience accordingly. Is it difficult? Yes, capital D, difficult. <laughs> um, but um, I think it's possible. But that the idea that certain people just can't talk in certain situations seems to be uh, prominent, and um, I think we need to do something about that. Mm. And what sure. about but, what about students uh, who are uh, slightly more melanated? Uh, how are yeah. how are they? <laughs> how are they? Um, are you getting any weird pushback from them, or do you think that they're they're receptive to what you're trying to say versus? Um, what's kind of going on, you know, you mentioned uh, the larger phenomenon in your field that is being, mm -hmm. that is being pushed, you know, do you feel like they're, they're more on your end of things or on their end of things, or is it a wash? Uh, I, I don't really talk about things uh, polemically. And, mm -hmm. and what I mean by that is, you know, I'm there to teach them about uh, rhetorical theory or considering rhetoric and, and certain uh, situations and things like that. I, I'm, I, I'm not in front of the class saying that um, they're wrong and I'm right. Right. No, I'm not. I'm not doing that. You know, that's yeah. that's not. I, I have no interest uh, in that. I am there to talk about rhetoric and the ability to be persuasive in given situations. Uh, the power of adaptability, right? Uh, the power of identify, identifying with your audience. Uh, all those different things. So I, I'm not. Mm. I'm not pushing my. Uh, viewpoint on them. I'm not pushing anti-wokeness, quote unquote. Ah, well, that's refreshing. Right. <laughs> yeah. But, but you are a critic of, I guess, what we would call the, 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 current, uh, the current manifestation of yeah, anti-racism. Mm -hmm. um, what exactly is, is your uh, critique of, of how that plays out uh, in society today? Um, just contemporary anti-racism? Yeah, like how, how it shows up um, in modern culture, in, in our schools. Um, what, what is your critique of, of how anti-racism? 
anti-racism as we understand it today is, is um, you know, talked about, written about in books, popular books, um, or, or practiced in boardrooms and, and uh, yeah. you know, corporate trainings and even um, universities. Um, I think what's going on is, um, I mean, we like to use the term CRT, but it's really uh, what's called critical social justice. And um, I'm glad uh, we're transitioning from critical race theory to critical social justice because the latter term does not have the word theory in it. And it mm. makes it, theory is not the dogma, right? Theory is a, a way of looking at the world that, you know, uh, could be fallible, right? Um, but it's just, it, this is a particular way, this is a theoretical lens through which we're seeing the world. Um, the problem is when theory is turned into dogma, right? And there is a right way of looking at this, period. It's already been established and your alternative viewpoint is wrong or in this context, racist, right? And that's what's going on. I'm not a big fan of banning things, I am a big fan of talking about things through more than one lens. Mm -hmm. So if you can talk about critical race theory and then talk about, um, you know, uh, more traditional civil rights uh, ideas uh, and, and do them together, right? Or, you know, uh, do them one at a time and uh, have your students compare and contrast and things like that. I think that's fine. That's not what's happening. What's happening is, I mean, one of the tenets of critical social justice um, that Robin DiAngelo um, art articulates is um, it's not whether racism happened, but how it manifested in that situation. Right. right? I mean, that's a dangerous tenet, man. You know, <laughs> uh, that's that, and, and that's the issue I have. Um, um, Jonathan Haidt and uh, uh, Greg Lucknow say um, they 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 talk about cognitive distortions, right? Um, and including mind reading, uh, fortune telling, right? Um, you know, thinking you already know what this person is about or what this person is going to say and, and, and things like that based on positionality, uh, how they look. Um, I think that's the issue I have with how anti-racism is manifesting in schools and corporate America, uh, things like that. There's no room for talk. There's no room for pushback. There's no room for, hey, maybe we should do it this way as opposed to another way, and mm -hmm. which, which means that there's no room for rhetoric, right? Uh, rhetoric only makes sense when there's a possibility of being wrong, right? Otherwise, if everything's uh, dogmatic, then there's no need for mm -hmm. ways of communication. You just say what it is, right? Yeah. The whole point of rhetoric is this might be wrong, it might be right, I think it's right, so here's how I'm going to persuade you to see it my way, right? Um, if you're dealing with dogma, then that has no place. It seems like, yeah, it, it, it almost sounds like, or at least the implication to me feels like people don't have the courage of their own convictions or they don't have the confidence in their ability to, to win against a, a worse argument, right? Instead, they want right. to just eliminate the argument altogether. Right. You know, to me, I'm like, well, I mean, if I think I'm right, then I think, I think my idea is going to win. So bring it. Right. But it doesn't right. seem that people have that attitude. And I wonder, I wonder why, why that is right. Like if this is clearly the right way, if this is clearly the truth, um, then it should withstand any scrutiny. Right. Cause that's just the nature of truth. So what do you think is going on there? Um, it's what's going on is a power grab. Um, yeah. And, 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 you know, I talk often about the um, systemic Marxism uh, <laughs> in my field. Uh, and I mean, there are- Unpack leaders, that, unpack that. Um, well, a, a, yeah. a, if not the uh, leader in uh, anti-racism in the field of rhetoric and composition is a card-carrying uh, Marxist. Uh, he says he's a scholar of Marxist strikes, uh, mm -hmm. quote unquote. And- um, you know, if you look at the origins of critical theory, critical race theory and critical theory, uh, it comes out of the Frankfurt School. 
Um, and especially Marcusa, who, you know, as you may know, I, James Lindsay is all over this. Uh, yeah. You know, um, it's about repressive tolerance. Uh, and, you know, you, you, don't, you don't accept anything from that side. You know, if you, talking is dignifying people with a response, right? Mm -hmm. uh, talking leads at best to reform. If you want revolution, talking is a waste of time. Right. That's that's kind of the the idea going on there. And um, there's, um, you know, this desire among a lot of people, in my field, to tear it down. Right. Uh, and if you're trying to tear things down, the last thing you want to do is have a good faith conversation with the people you're trying to tear down. Right. That's mm. not, you know, uh, if, if you do that, you're only looking for reform. Right. You're looking to meet halfway or something like that. And uh, that's not what they want. Mm. I think that's why, you know, you have uh, Professor Candy refusing to debate Colm right. Hughes, for example, quite famously. You know, I was speaking of Candy, I was actually going to ask you, just from, a, from, your, from the standpoint of somebody trained in, in rhetoric, um, what, what is the, the, the criticism from, from your professional field of, of Kendi's um, attempt to define racism, which I will read <laughs> I would define it as a collection of racist policies that lead to racial in inequity that are substantiated by racist ideas. Uh, is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that is his definition that the world's most famous anti-racist wrote the book on it. Um, that is very popular. Mm. Um, that's how he is defining um, racism. And uh, it just seems like, you know, now that I understand rhetoric better and, and that the goal is, 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 is to create more understanding, this seems like a red flag. Well, it, it's, uh, it seems on its surface like circular reasoning, right? You don't use the term to define the term, right? Correct. But uh, to come to his defense, he does uh, previously define what racist is and uh, as far as he is describing it. And, 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 and then he says, uh, you know, something okay. like that uh, yeah. uh, in the book. You know, so there, there, there is that. Um, but the okay. idea that, you know, um, all racial disparities are a result of racism, right? That's a popular idea um, in academia in general, yeah. you know, let alone my field, mm -hmm. right? So, and that's kind of uh, what he's uh, getting at there. You know, that is the explanation. It's nothing else, right? right? And a lot of people will talk about, okay, well, you know, um, uh, culture, uh, home dynamics, things like that. Um, a, a lot of other things can come into play, uh, but that's controversial, right? Um, you know, it, it seems like you're blaming the victim, right? Um, and, and, and that idea is, is uh, rampant in, in, uh, in academia. Yeah. So uh, they're, they're embracing what, what Kendi's saying. I'm glad, I'm glad you, you made that, uh, that point because I was going to say, I don't have it in front of me and I, it's been a while since I read it, but Kendi does describe racism in, I think, a very cogent and coherent way in his book. Um, there's nothing about the actual definition that I remember taking issue with. It seemed very straightforward and reasonable, but then it's more about the conclusions that, that get drawn after that, which is what you just outlined, where you know the, the response, he basically it creates this rhetorical trap where, you know, the, the reason for group disparities can only be one of two things. And one is racism or racist systems. And the other is actual inferiority of one group versus another. Right. And there's no other options. Right. Right. That's a total rhetorical trap. <laughs> it's like. Uh, it, it's not, it's not just a rhetorical trap. It's a, a fallacy. It's a, you mm -hmm. know, logical, either orism you know, false dichotomy or something like that, whatever you want to mm. call it. And B, it's supposed to be one of the aspects of white culture that uh, Judith Cass and Tima Oaken and um, the, the, um, the infographic that the uh, National Museum, yeah, you, you know yeah. what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, uh, either, yeah. or -ism, either or ism is a white way of knowing, you oh know? And, and here <laughs> is Cindy basing his entire understanding of anti-racism on either orism, you know, and, and mm. that, that guys, 
is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so I, I, I will say so. You know, uh-huh. I will say, you know, you, you have any idea how blatantly you're contradicting yourself here. Mm. And a lot of them do, and they don't care because it's about power. Yeah. Right? Well, that that's certainly true of of a lot of, you know, people who would call themselves woke or social justice yeah. warriors, however they want to refer to themselves. But people on that side of of this this ar- argument would probably do that. But I don't know if, to be fair to Kendi, I don't know if he ever said, you know, uh, punctuality and well, no, no, no. Yeah. that sort of right. stuff is white, the right? So hopefully, right, right, right. right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, hopefully. I mean, hopefully he's not down with that. But <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. It is kind of silly that there are a lot of weird tautologies and just dead ends, logical dead ends. There, it's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. It really yeah. is. So I really wanted to talk to you about this because we actually didn't get to chat too much. Um, but you and I got into it with Nicole Hannah Jones a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this past yeah. summer. So this was this past summer, I, just to keep everybody up to speed. Um, so I wrote a piece for, for an op-ed for Newsweek and it, it was called, um, stop calling me white for having the wrong opinions. Oh, right. And it in it, I describe what I call the one thought rule, which is yeah. when, you know, it's this kind of, it's this kind of bullying tactic, this, this in-group gatekeeping that happens when you do not conform to whatever some some self some self appointed authority's idea of what a member of a particular group should do, think, feel, or be, right, or behave. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was talking very much about about that sort of phenomenon. And one of the examples that I used was this idea that Nicole Hannah Jones in a, a now deleted tweet where she said, "It's you know." there's a difference between being black and politically black. Right. And we should, you know, (laughs) so, so, you know, I mean, I guess I, I guess it's my fault. I sort of summoned it because I did refer to her. Um, but she, she, she put me on blast on Twitter and it, it turned into like a 24 to 48 hour clusterfuck. And then Eric, (laughs) Eric, you jumped in, um, and you wrote, you wrote your own piece in re in reaction to her response to me. So tell us, tell us about that and tell us what made you want to do that. Um, well, first of all, she was being unfair. She was misrepresenting you yeah. um, in a lot of ways. Um, and, you know, she was drifting into ad hominem territory. Um, so what I wanted to do was set the record straight on her erroneous interpretation of what you were talking about and kind of identify what she was doing, Right. Um, and I call it uh, erase and, and uh, replace, right? I think that's what I call it in the yeah. in the article. And what that is is a combination of ad hominem and straw man um, to a large degree. So you say something that you know uh, is a good point. So instead of engage that, she does two things: attack you as a person, and say you said something you did, right? right? in an attempt just to get rid of you, not to engage with you, right? Um, not even to have a thorough and well thought out reason uh, for disagreeing with you, just to silence you and get rid of you, erase you and replace you with somebody who says something absurd so that she can point out that it's absurd. Right. Mm-hmm. And I saw her doing that and I saw it as an opportunity to uh, illustrate with a real life situation what I mean by erase and replace. And um, I also wanted to just, you know, show her that she wasn't going to get away with that stuff. <laughs> so a teachable moment for you, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but, but did you, did you, I, I missed this, but um, I, I did obviously read Angel's article, but I missed the, the, this kerfuffle with her. Um, yeah. but, but did you, did you engage with her substantively on the point that she was actually making or was it just kind of a defensive? Uh, me? Well. Angel. She, yeah, well, either she you or Eric. She didn't tag me. So she just screenshotted the article and then made her comments. Um, and, and I guess the point I was making was, you know, this, this essentializing and then this bullying, this in-group gatekeeping, like I'm supposed to be a certain way because I am this type of person, this, this person from this group, that's gross and we shouldn't do it. And 
on top of that, I reject all the categories to begin with. So, you know, like forget race. I reject it yeah, just yeah. on whole cloth. So I'm not white. I'm not black. I'm not anything. I'm, I'm me and I'm human. And on a, when on a census form, when someone asks me what I'm going to fill out um, or what I, what my race is, I'm going to put human from now on. And I'm going to proudly do it because the whole thing is ridiculous. And, and the way that she um, interpreted it was like, you know, okay, so this person is saying he's not black. So why does he care when people say he's not black? Right. So she kind of took, she put the cart before the horse, right? right? What I was talking about was growing up being it, called right. white, right? And so, so that was the the whole, that was the whole thing there. But I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, it it kind of backfired. I don't know if she, I don't know if she's aware of how many people follow her who may not necessarily agree with her. They just kind of hate follow her or something. I don't know why people would do that, but people do it. Um, but the engagement was like. I, I was, you know, people kept DMing me and asking me if I was okay. <laughs> and I, I kept telling them, like, it's like being at the dentist. Like, you feel a lot of pressure, but no pain. It was just kind of, like, really intense for a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, Eric, yeah. did you engage with her at all? Uh, no. No. Okay. I, and she didn't engage with me. Uh, mm -hmm. I, um, and and I'm, I don't know if she even knew about the article or anything like that. Uh, yeah. The point was just to talk to again, is to talk to other people about this uh, ridiculousness. Um, so <laughs> that's um, that's why I wrote that, and uh, I don't, you know, people like that don't engage me, mm. you know. Um, and if they did, I would thoroughly welcome it. Uh, people think I'm crazy for running to the conflict. Right. Instead of, uh, you know, uh, trying to prevent it or running away from it. I, um, I, I think it's necessary to run to the conflict. I even tell my students conflict can be a good thing. You know, it's good tension, as Martin Luther King uh, said. Uh, it mm. can uh, result in better situations that wouldn't have come about otherwise. So, uh, you know, don't run from conflict. Embrace it. See what you can get out of it. All right. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, she, yeah well, they don't they don't they didn't they don't talk to me you know yeah. they uh they they talk to other people they engage with other people they screenshot other people they don't they don't do that uh to mm. me maybe they don't care about me maybe they don't know who i am yeah. um then, no no i'm fine. sure i'm sure that no i i think you're you're kind of dangerous to their uh tactics and also to their um ideology oh you know yeah. I, I mean that's I, my opinion but I would think they try to, uh, you know, erase and replace me. I, I yeah. think they try to demonize me or degrade me, right? Uh, to discredit me, um, mm -hmm. like the like the people in my field try to do. <laughs> you know, um, and they have. I mean, I, 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 it amazes me that they're still trying uh, to do that, like, as if it's going to work. They have no idea. I'm the, I'm the kind of person. If you do that, I'm just going to get bigger and louder. <laughs> you know, like, they haven't figured that out yet. You're like the rhetorical I, Hulk. You just, yeah, you just yeah. <laughs> the more you do that, the more I'm going to, you know, yeah. destroy you. Uh, <laughs> you know, so I, and, and um, you know, and, and of course, Melissa, you're basically saying that maybe they, they know that, you know, uh, so. or something and, yeah. and uh, they're not engaging. And also your, I mean, I hate to say it, but your identity is also a shield, right? Like they cannot attack you in, in ways that they can attack, you know, other critics of, of their ideology that's true. and their tactics. So that's unfortunate, yeah. but yeah. yeah, we, we want to live in a world where that's not true. As you say, you want your, all your students to be able to, to be comfortable saying what they really right. think. But, but right now as the, as the parameters of discourse uh, exist, it, it is, you know, very easy to shut down somebody, mm. um, you know, who's the wrong color. But you're doing you're doing some wonderful proactive work with this, uh, Eric. I want to make sure we talk about free black thought because it's such an important thing, and it's touching on all the things that we've talked about. So I think before we wrap up, we should definitely uh, get into this a little bit. Tell us about free black thought. Tell us about its its inception and its 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 mission. Well, its mission has a lot to do with the article you uh, wrote for Newsweek. You know, you're not allowed to have uh, certain ideas. Uh, if you are black, you should be, quote unquote, politically black. And therefore, 
embracing uh, a certain way of looking at things, right? And if you have the same goal, like racial equality or something like that, or you have the same goal, but you, you have different ideas about it, right? Um, ideas that either don't align with theirs or directly contradict theirs, then my God, there's something wrong with you. You're not really black, right? <laughs> so free black thought is about acknowledging viewpoint diversity um, within the black community. I don't even like saying the black community. That, that implies a monolithic take on, on race, but right. But you, you know what I mean. Uh, and, and, and to celebrate that viewpoint diversity. Right. And to uh, showcase it, we have a compendium uh, of uh, various uh, African-American writers uh, talking about various things. And the main point of that compendium is to uh, show people the ideas coming from uh, the black intelligentsia. I, I'll, I'll say that uh, that aren't mainstream that you don't hear uh, in, in mainstream news outlets. Right. Um, that aren't embraced and put forth in diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings and, and things like that. We also have a journal um, uh, that people contribute to. Uh, uh, big names, uh, not so big names that we hope to make big, right? <laughs> um, these are the people we, uh, we publish in the journal, um, again, to celebrate viewpoint diversity and to show people uh, the arguments behind viewpoint diversity. Um, and uh, to show them that there's more than one take on this and that black people don't all think the same. What a concept. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wonder also like the, the kind of contrast that you have now between uh, free black thought and, you know, an organization like, like Blexit, which is, <laughs> which is, you know, completely a, a different thing. Instead of like focusing on viewpoint diversity, um, it's, th that seems to be far more activist in its, uh, in its, in its goal. I mean, that, that started by Candace Owens and it's basically a, a, a drive to register more, more black Republicans. And I, I do worry about, you know, um, just kind of like, it will, it will make me very sad if, if, um, Blexit, for example, is just more popular and more has more momentum and more media attention than free black thought, which I, 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 from the looks of it kind of, you know, just at least what I see on social media seems to be the case. Um, and it's kind of like a, it, it makes me sad for kind of the case for, for, you know, nonpartisanship, um, moderation. Um, cause it seems like it, it, the way the world is set up right now in the culture and discourse, it, it is to favor the kind of more extreme, um, right. the, the more extreme, you know, the pendulum swinging the other way. And uh, I, I love what you guys do at Free Black Thought. And I, um, you know, I'm really glad that FAIR supports, uh, supports the work as well. Yeah, thank you. So am I. Yeah, what do you yeah. think about the, the Blexit, Blexit thing? I haven't really given it much thought. But what do you think is going on I, over there? <laughs> I, I, I haven't either, to be honest with you. But I mean, I do. And I know some of uh, Candace Owens', Owens uh, her backstory. And... Part of it I can relate to. Um, I'm I'm a lifelong Democrat, uh, and I don't know, you know, I, like that party has let me down <laughs> so mm -hmm. so much, right? That uh, I, I I don't know if I can call myself a Democrat anymore. I don't know. I, I'm a political orphan, right? I I, uh, I don't I don't feel comfortable in this party anymore. This party doesn't like me. <laughs> You know, that's, that's how I feel. This party doesn't like, me, you know, and they're not afraid to express it in various ways. Mm. So, um, I mean, you know, it, 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 in a way, Owen might be saying, I, I know where I'm not wanted. You know, you know, I, 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 I you have to tell me to leave twice. You know, uh, mm. that kind of uh, idea that that could be, you know, it. And if that is it, then I kind of get that, you know. It's 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 sad, but I kind of get that now. It, as opposed to Blexit, what I do is call out the party, uh, you know, for for what it's doing, and well, ridicule the ridiculous ideas therein, right? <laughs> um, and and try to deal with it that way, right? Um, I'm not going to. I mean, there's a 
there's a tacit pushback in Blexit, right? You're you're going to uh, the Republican Party, which is to say, I no longer believe in the Democratic Party. So there's there's that inherent argument there. Um, I also don't believe in a Democratic Party, but I want to fix it. I don't want to I don't want to run away. I want to I want to stay mm. here and and get rid of the absurdities. Mm. Right. So I think that's the, the difference with me. Um, and I don't know what that would be called. Um, it's definitely not black, uh, black entrance. entrance. <laughs> I don't I don't I don't know what I don't know what to call it, but I'll figure it out. Well, I, I think free black thought is 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 the it perfect does, summation. It, yeah. it, it really is. I mean, it, yeah, it really it really is. It's, it's just unmooring yourself from um, from a certain orientation, a certain political orientation that that people really associate black thought to be analogous, yeah. like completely synonymous with. And yeah. and and the idea of untethering that and saying no, think for yourself, be independent. Don't you don't have to jump straight into another party just because you right. feel feel homeless. I think I think that is the orientation of of your of your organization. Yeah, thank you. I like that. <laughs> All right. Well, Eric, we we have um, we have a final question that we ask all our guests. Uh, as you know, our focus at FAIR is providing a pro-human approach to issues of race and issues of groupthink and you know all these sorts of things that we've been discussing. And so the question for you is, uh, what does pro-human mean to you? How do you conceptualize that idea? And how do you think people can be more pro-human in their everyday lives? Um, I think pro-human to me is seeing people as uh, not just individuals, but as people who can express themselves to you in ways that you may not expect. And and what I mean by that is to be pro-human is to not project an identity onto somebody you don't know um, based on how they look, even based on the things they write or or, or something like that. Uh, you're meeting them as they are. You're open to um, having a conversation um, in good faith. You're open to um, what um, the late rhetorician Wayne Booth called listening rhetoric, um, which is a good faith attempt to try to understand this other person um, uh, through not just emotional empathy, but cognitive empathy. Why do you think what you think? Um, maybe I can tell you why I think what I think, and we can go from there. We may have commonalities that we didn't realize. Um, being open to that, being uh, pro-human to me is abiding by that listening rhetoric. Mm. Beautifully said. Eric Smith, thank you so much for joining us on Fair Perspectives. Uh, thank you for having me. This was fun. Thank you for listening to Fair Perspectives. If you'd like to support the show, you can do it by subscribing on YouTube and on your favorite podcast platform and leaving us a positive rating and review. You can also access exclusive podcast content, such as Q&As and bonus episodes, by visiting us and signing up at fairperspectives.org. For weekly fair news and opinion pieces by members of the fair community, visit our Substack at fairforall.substack.com and tune into Fair News Weekly wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to join or support the pro-human movement, visit us at fairforall.org slash join us. Thanks again, and see you next time.